Okay, so the first question is to, I think it's Dr. Halako, uh, Dr. Anjum. How do you counter the claims of modernity that previous systems of governance, like feudalism and imperialism, were more oppressive? Second, does Islam favor an imperial system of governance? If not, what kind of system of governance is favored by Islam? Okay, that's one question. And the second question that's come, which is really, the other questions were just repetitive. The concept of sovereignty is in the central domain of the Muslim state. Would it be correct to say that Muslims and all people in general are living in a situation of default shirk, knowingly or unknowingly, as a citizen of the modern state, whether participating through the votes or participating through the state legislature, executive, or simply accepting the order of things? Fickle question. Fickle question. You're special. But do you want to... No, please. No, no. Answer, answer. So the, the first question, whether previous systems like feudalism uh, were more oppressive. Part of the challenge is that our knowledge of what the feudal system were is uh, filtered by, uh, our, our, by the Enlightenment period scholarship. In fact, modern departments of history are really products of the Enlightenment, and over the last 30, 40 years, uh, or even slightly longer in European studies, there is this trend of revisionism where people are, in fact, figuring uh, or finding that much of the traditional image of Oriental despots and feudalism uh, were, in fact, constructions of Enlightenment scholars who were very ideological. Uh, the second, um, I guess I'll make my answer very short. A recent book by David Wengro and David Graeber, uh, which is really uh, the most updated scholarship based on anthropological and archaeological data of what pre-modern societies look like. And uh, one conclusion that this book uh, reaches is that you have all kinds of models in the past, ones that were egalitarian, much more just, much more thriving than what we have in the modern state, and then there were terrible examples. So you do not have a law that says modernity is, has you know, gotten better or worse, but in some ways, the powers of modernity uh, are unprecedented. And so if you're looking for a simply historical answer to what we know based on anthropological, historical, archaeological data, um, then that assumption is not true. If you're talking about medieval Europe, which is one out of 10,000 different societies, then the question is, why just talk about medieval Europe? Um, and on the question of sovereignty in central, in central domain of Islam, and are is living in contemporary societies shirk? This is a you know fiqhi and aqidah question. I do not believe that any Muslim scholars believe that merely by living in contemporary Muslim societies you're committing shirk. Yeah. Just the last one from online was uh, Dr. Halak. Uh, you seem to reference more from the left, Foucault and Co. Uh, do you know? Do you not know any reference libertarian conservative philosophers like Oakshot or Pushkin? What are your thoughts, do you think? Roger Scruton, who died this? Well, I, I um, <coughs> resort to thinkers who help me think. Uh, it doesn't mean that those I, those I don't resort to don't help me think, but I cannot resort to everybody. Many people say, oh, why haven't you? It's just because they know that particular thinker doesn't mean that I have to be using that thinker. Uh, I will explore it and see maybe it is more useful to me than, let's say, what is useful to me now, such as, for example, as we said in the last session, Foucault. But, 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 uh, but uh, the, the, the series of, uh, of, of brilliant and helpful thinkers is, is almost endless. So uh, it's, there's always somebody that will, and we, many of the people are thinking in, in sem on similar lines. So it's. Uh, it's an endless uh, ocean. So.
Okay, so we're going to open up the floor. So very quickly, just ask a question, and, and then we'll try. So we'll take three questions at a time, and then we'll get responses. So yourself. So my two questions are. Your name and oh. where you come from, institution. Uh, Hamza, I'm a student at the University of Toledo. Um, my question was, you you talked about the idea of society being a recent phenomenon, which I I agree with. My question was, when Muslims talk about working towards societal progress, is their approach flawed, and does it is there any way to work towards societal progress outside of the legal arm of the modern state? And that's one question. And the other question was. With the recent events in Afghanistan, um, with the Taliban taking over the country, and your whole critique of, you know, the modern nation state, are the Taliban is it is it bound to be a failed project in the long run? Um, you know, we've seen how like the central bank uh, assets have been frozen, etc. Is that just a symptom of the modern nation state framework? Is there any way? that entity can escape the situation they find themselves in. To, to answer the last one quickly, because it, it actually pertains to the last chapter of the impossible state, okay. is that if, if, if the attempt is above the radar, it's going to be demolished and destroyed by the powers to be. And this is what's happening. Above the, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the, 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 uh, but the, for the societal progress, depends what you mean by societal progress. If it's going to be another version of what the state is doing, then we are not getting anywhere. We are just replicating, and this is the, the whole point of my critique of, of the possibility of a state, uh, modern state in Islam, is that we would just be, it would be in the name of, it's like the fin uh, Islamic finance. It would be a, 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 the normal capitalist finance given some Islamic names. But the veneer is, looks Islamic, but everything else in it is, uh, is not. It is capitalistic of the first order. So societal progress has to do with the nation state. You can't have the, word, the state no. building. Well, the, the, the other, the, yeah, the, 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 there's another, another problem with this is that the idea of progress itself, societal progress itself, is highly problematic. And the, the, we tend to use progress you know, as if it is uh, a natural thing, and as if it is a fantastic, wonderful thing. Progress is getting us where we are today. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be progressive, but the progress has, has also an ethical component to it. It's just not materialistic only. It's not institutional only. I really do not care about institutions and materialism if it's going to lead us to hell. Yeah. And progress is leading us to hell. If we do not act seriously by 2050, we are going to be encountering severe, severe crisis. We are already in the crisis, health-wise, uh, environmental-wise. Uh, in, in every way, we are in crisis. And I'm not talking about anything else but the environmental crisis. If I start talking to you about the societal uh, uh, meaning here, social crisis, the disintegration of the social order, the, the, the rise, the alarming rise of mental disease, uh, the, 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 the engaging in what we learned about 50 years ago, the rise of the therapeutic culture, which is actually one of the worst in indications of where we are today in terms of crisis, and the, 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 the rate of suicide, etc., etc., etc. It's endless. The, the, the book of the problems we have is a very thick one. Mm -hmm. this is the, so we have to look, uh, they take another look at what, it, what progress means. Progress cannot be materialistic without being bound by an ethical framework. If, there, it, if it's not bounded by an ethical, uh, and we begin here with capitalism, then there is no such, I will not accept any kind of progress. Let's say we change the word. We'll Sorry. Back to the word. Yeah, yeah. So quickly, your name, where you're from, and um, question. And we'll Sadar, go one more after. I study at the University of Virginia. Um, Dr. Halla, I wanted to ask about, due to the nature of how we're talking about these topics, it's about the dichotomy between the paradigms of the Sharia and modernity. Um, it tends to paint, uh, modernity is very new, but it, tends, it, it paints the Sharia, the 1500 year, history and evolution of the Sharia with one long stroke, and that's not perhaps very faithful to the history. You're in your own books, uh, frequently when you explain Islamic legal terms and theory, you make an exception, for example, for the Ottomans, and I mean, it would be pretty obvious, I think, for if uh, Khalifa Omar looked at Ottoman bureaucracy or the Kanun, he would not find anything, he would not recognize what it is. I was, uh, one, wanted to ask how you would understand that difference and how that relates to how we're comparing the, the modernity in yeah. Thank you. Come, come and then one more question. I think it was, uh, uh, okay, I, I can sort of be. I think so. Yep. Uh, my, no, sorry. Uh, should I? 
Yeah, it's okay. Oh, sorry, I'm Anas. I'm a graduate student at UCLA. Um, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, what was the Oh, the question is, um, in terms of uh, the formation of the subjectivity, which is, I think, that one form property of the modern project that uh, may not necessarily be a form property in that it's tied to capitalism and liberalism, and which, and the book you say is not a form property because there are modern states that were not capitalist and were not liberal but that most of the problems that we find in the modern subject, the narcissism, the fragmentation, are tied uniquely, perhaps, to capitalism and to liberalism. And so I was going to ask, is it possible that, uh, I mean, for instance, here we are. We are trying to, we, we're basically engaged in what you would call, or Foucault called a subversive discourse. We're trying to upend the, the paradigm. And the formation of the moral subject in Islam is tied to prayer, to siyam, to, and we are capable under the, under the modern state has given us the ability to do these things so we can produce the moral subject mm -hmm. that there are challenges as it goes without saying um, that we can produce this moral subject and be able to alter certain you know cer certain uh, let's say negative or unethical formations and the second thing is how would you respond to the argument or a corollary to this is how would you respond to the one who might say that Modern governance uh, helps fashion the moral subject in a better way than Islamic governance because in, in the more, in, uh, crucial to the formation of the moral subject is the world view. Is the Without the cosmic world view, the technology of the self goes into technology of the body, basically. It, fasting is not a, an ethical operation on myself, but rather it could end up just being me being healthy or me learning how to go without. Whereas without the cosmic world view, and my, my understanding of my place in the world, and that's crucial to the concept of, of, of the technology of the self. Why can't I? If I don't have the cosmic worldview, if I don't believe in God, and I don't believe that God is an ethical being, why can't I believe that matter is brute, inert, and stupid? Why can't I, at the end of the day, think that any ethics that is not centered in a religious framework is just instrumentalist at the end of the day? I'm being good because it's an, I somehow end up benefiting from the system. Uh, but whereas in the, so the modern governance allows me to contemplate and reach this cosmic worldview in a better way than the Islamic governance did because the Islamic governance had the law of apostasy. And the law of apostasy, what made me an apostate, or what made me have a ta'wil sa'ikh, let's say, whether my interpretation of Islam is plausible or not is based upon Greek logic, partially at least, uh, or sort of an introduction of Greek logic to Meaning that if I, for example, Ghazali would accuse me of being a disbeliever if I thought that the verses about hell were figurative. Whereas if I didn't think that the verses of the sifat, of the divine attributes, were figurative, I'm also a kafir. So the one who determines who is kafir and who is Muslim in this system is a foreign object, which is Greek logic. Whereas now I am capable, and that's why a lot of uh, theologians ended up either in jail or killed. A lot of... Um, Okay. But, uh, yeah. this, so far, you have two questions. Yeah. So your question. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's what it is. That if we go back to the first one. Yeah. When you say cosmic cosmic view, how does this make you an ethical uh, person? Well, if I mean, I'm vis-a-vis uh, -vis someone who adopts a religious viewpoint and who does the, the what you call ritualistic, which do, do not have to be ritualistic. They could be very substantive in the way I describe them, which were, by the way, by the entirety of the Sufi tradition and by much of the Sharia. Mm -hmm. This is why Sufism comes to kind of modify the Sharia. Is to, the Sufism deepens this psycho-epistemic and psycho-performative uh, um, uh, technology which creates the ethical subject. This is, this is the, the main reason. I have a whole argument about this Sufism uh, role, but it, uh, it's not the place for it. But the, the point is that how does this cosmic view, which is actually a way of beautifying the modern subject, mm -hmm. uh, the, the creates uh, an, a create an, an ethical individual? So, yeah, I would like oh, to oh, that. Uh, so because this cosmic world view posits God as the creator and the owner of the universe, meaning any, like you said, any owner, or sorry, in the book you'd say, any ownership or mm -hmm. any relation that I might have with nature or with anything, or with human beings, mm -hmm. is derivative and, own, and subject to the permission of this greater being. And this greater being defines for me my role or my place in this 
So yeah, how is this contradictory with prayer and, and the other things that you... I, I see, I see no. all of what you've said to be actually an integral part of the Islamic... Uh, that's, what I thought, that's what I was saying. Well, I didn't... I didn't oh, no, I meant to say that if I don't have this worldview, uh -huh. then pray... For example, if I don't believe in God, okay. then prayer is just that's a bunch of movements to me. Sure, yeah. And if I don't... And, and nature is stupid. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is what we are talking about. I don't understand the question at all now. Oh, sorry. Okay, let me I'll just say it again. Because the main problem today is the emergence of this atheism, yeah, yeah. or this new atheism, sure. some people call it, which basically targets this worldview as being just mere superstition and mere myth. So we need to have a. So somebody can argue that religion is crucial for the for the formation of the ethical subject, without which, uh, without which. I cannot be an ethical son, or at least my ethics is instrumental in nature. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Exactly. I mean, they, 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 are, they are absolutely right, and this is what I've been trying to say. You can call it religion, you can, you can call it many things. If we, for example, we don't call Hinduism and Taoism real religions and the definition from the perspective of, 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 of the monotheistic religions, but they are actually religions in that general, and there are many other possible religions that fit uh, uh, the, this definition, but the ultimate, the ultimate point here is that, and this is where we are stuck if we don't do it, mm -hmm. is that if we do not have a concept of creation, of some sort, of one of sort or another, we will never have intrinsic value for things in the world. In other words, a tree can never be proven to have an intrinsic value if it is not believed that there is a power that created the tree, and the same power that created the tree created me as well. In other words, we are the tree and myself are actually two mem different members of the same kind of category. We are members of a class, and therefore the tree becomes sacred. And and so many religions, are, but 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 secularism, especially the secular modern world with its heavy uh, atheistic uh, uh, bent, has a tremendous. And this is the problem of of of, of the environmental philosophers. They have a problem of proving the, the intrinsic value of things without resorting to uh, what we call religion. Mm. It's impossible. So I, we, we agree. I don't think that it, it's not easy to figure out why we are in trouble today. It's actually fairly simple. The, the issue is not that we are, the issue is to convince people that they, there are things un, lurking under their feet that they have not seen in, well enough. And second, that we need to act and the action is more important than just the, now the diagnosis is, is, is given. We, we know what's going on that, that is wrong. But how do we, we fix it is, is, is the problem. And that's why where people don't want either to see it intellectually or they are not willing to make concessions. Because in order to remedy the situation, every one of us has to become more responsible towards what, what, the way we live. We have to think about everything we do every day. And this is what is ruining the planet, is what we do every day on simply from, from from wiping your table with, table with, with, with a, with a ta paper towel to buying a, 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 a bottle of Coke and throwing the, the, in, the, in, the, in the supposedly recycling and whatnot. That's the problem. The problem is that we need to start re rethinking our ways of, of living. Literally, every act we do must now become intentional if we were to solve our problems. That is the last thing what capitalism doesn't want us to do. But you don't believe that oh, capitalism we'll, is a... a we'll, sorry. Come, we'll come back to oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Do, you, do you want to respond to uh, his question? About uh, the um, monolithic picture of political... As I said at least a couple of times before in public, I should have, uh, the, the possible state should have been... Uh, uh, now I'm beginning to think not only should have been 100 pages longer, maybe 200 pages longer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, because, because one of the things that I would have wanted to elaborate but I like to write shorter books, to be honest with you, because I don't like to, write, to read long books, I myself. <laughs> so I thought that, but it was a mistake. I should have written in detail about the, and because the political aspect was so important of the book, although the book is not just about politics. Uh, I think that, that I would distinguish uh, three phases that Muslims went through politically. Each phase, of course, experiences its internal dynamic change, you know, piecemeal change, subtle change, but nonetheless change to, to accommodate reality. But they, it had the, 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 a unitary epistemology, so to speak, or rather a, a, some coherence within 
the, uh, the, 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 the rules of play. One is the politics uh, that, that ends around the rise of the gunpowder empires. With the rise of the gunpowder empires, and it's not coincident that they arose at the same time that Europe begins to jump up in modern renaissance first and then the enlightenment and modern ways, the gunpowder empires begin, a, uh, which we call generally in the scholarship, post-classical Islam. The gunpowder em empires begin a slight tilt within this kind of politics toward modern, what became modern institutions. We identify them with the benefit of hindsight as modern, but at the time they didn't see it. They said that it was what it was. It was the pressure that Europe put on, on, on the empire, especially the Ottoman, that made them uh, readjust certain things. But the Ottoman Empire, which was one, the, the most of the three, that, that it, it made this uh, kind of adaptation towards a new age, so I don't know what to call it, I don't have the language, um, remained in, in structurally and essentially an Islamic empire. Despite everything, for example, there was no Muslim empire in the entire, uh, entirety of Islamic history that experienced bureaucratization and centralization like the Ottoman Empire. <coughs> And it, it, it managed to survive, actually, the longest of the three. Uh, but despite the central, despite the making the Hanafi school the main, uh, the main madhab and uh, relegating the other three into secondary position, despite all of these attempts, which looked a little bit like what Europe was doing, it remained functionally and systemically in an Islamic empire. It could not make the, that jump at the end, which really were, were in, in terms of equality, uh, 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 cognate with the, with the European experience. When you say that so there are, I distinguish these two, and then I, of course, introduced in the 19th century the colonialist experiment. So Muslims went three, through three uh, uh, um, political eras, uh, the third of which is the most drastic, which right. is under colonialism. It, it, it involved total uh, dismantling and reconstruction of their system. Would you, would you say that... Would you, we're getting up to color orientalism. The late, that's the first session, isn't it? So yes. Maybe yeah. if you hold out your question. I was just, uh, this is the first oh, yeah, right, yeah. Would you say that those um, sort of bureaucratization and systemization that happened within the Ottomans to a very high degree, that fed into the eventual, um, maybe we can call it decline of fiqh and ijtihad in yeah, that Absolutely. Time? And uh, was, that, was that a sort of erosion of the full version in a way, of the Sharia. Yes, uh, actually, I do describe this in detail in the Sharia book, right. in, the, in, the in, this, in the third part. Mm -hmm. uh, there, is, there is a fairly detailed account there of, of how things happened, because I actually focus on, on two major phenomena. One is the Ottoman Empire, and the other one right. is uh, India. So the would, British, the, so the how Indian much, of the British. Right. So how much, uh, then, can we learn from that erosion, and especially the Tanzimat era, and even the Turkish Republic, where the Anatolia self-colonized itself and sort of self-removed the Sharia the shari systems from within. And how can we learn to, I guess, in a way, maybe reverse that or not fall into the same holes? That's a big question. We, 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 <laughs> maybe we'll come to this uh, today and tomorrow and, and, and the next 30 years. <laughs> Could you so like so we're going to start the next session, but I just want to get, uh, Dr. Andrew, do you want to comment on any of the questions or responses? Uh, no, I think that, so Anas's question I think was really about negative liberty. It was based on the premise that liberalism provides negative liberty. Uh, and it was based on an assumption that faith, which is really Protestant modern assumption, that faith requires negative liberty. And I think that, that we really can't get into it right now, but perhaps in later. Yeah. Well, there is a lot about uh, indirectly and directly that I, I will say about this. Dr. Haddad, could you clarify, maybe I use the wrong term, I said progress, it has its connotations, but the idea of like societal reform or islah in society, is that question even a question perhaps, it's, it's just the wrong approach, the idea of reforming society, like creating, you know, when people I, say, I, I think, what, what does to, that mean? To, to, give you, to give you a very bare outline of the proposed solution, insofar as I think uh, everybody has their own, is, 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 is that we will not get anywhere mm -hmm. without starting with basically educating ourselves first and, and the new generation with different values. 
-hmm. It has to start from schools, literally. Schools, from grade one, grade two, until, it, this is the one, I am against revolutions, against drastic change, not because of the violence involved only, but also because they don't work. Mm -hmm. Revolutions and drastic changes don't work because they might come back to haunt you. You force something on, on, on people who don't believe these things, they'll, they'll, they'll look at Turkey and what Ataturk did. Turkey came back to, uh, to, to, uh, to take revenge on, on, on that history in some way. And it could have been worse. But, uh, thankfully, in Turkey, it happened peacefully. But, but, but I, I think education is the only path for us. The way we were educated into modernity, you really we, can, so? we can get out of modernity through education. But the, we have no other way. I, I cannot see any other way. We'll come back to I would okay. love to hear other uh, yeah, that, yeah, that was, that was really the, the crux of it. Is it yeah. just education? Yeah, we've or? got a lot of questions um, I can see on the group come through. Everybody. But good education, mm -hmm. quality time, education yeah. that attends to, uh, yeah, to, to what matters, really. It's not education that is instrumentalist, that is in the service of some greedy entity. Or uh, We need to, to, to look at the bigger pictures. We need to look at the meaning of life. What is it? Why are we here? Yeah. It's not as it's, 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 we, we need to forget about Mercedes's, our Mercedes and boots, and, 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 uh, and, and start talking about something more. I'm not saying that one shouldn't be. Uh, Muslims lived throughout, they were the biggest merchants in the world. They made more money probably than any other. They and the Chinese. They made more money until the 16th century, more than money than any other people in the world. This is why the Europeans targeted them, by the way, because they, were, they had lots of money. Uh, but how, how but can you educate without power? Sorry. No, that's right. You need, you need some power, but the power used in, in an enlightened way, enlightened in the, in more in, 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 in the Islamic Buddhist way than the enlightenment itself. Funnily, that we call the enlightenment is the only thing that, although Buddhism, if you translate it in, in, in terms of self, that it, it, it does mean enlightenment, etc., but we don't refer it as such. We refer to the enlightenment as enlightenment, which is the standard and paradigmatic enlightenment, and actually, to be honest with you, I do not see anything enlightened about that enlightenment. Oh, we, it, we, the we, thinking we, has, we, been, has, has been destructive overall, despite the good intentions of some philosophers, despite the, 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 uh, the, the uh, seemingly brilliant ideas. But we are not, we are the beneficiaries of a very, very uh, destructive tendency here. And where does it come from? Fantastic. Thank okay, you. With that note, maybe what we can do, Dr. Halak and uh, Professor Andrew, at some point later on with uh, uh, Dr. Timothy, maybe we can co poach you to the AIC and teach more modules on uh, these subjects, maybe inshallah, hopefully. But right now, back to our continuing our program. This is the third session, so we're going to be looking at the nature of Orientalism, chapters one and two. So we're going to continue with that for the next hour and then QA based on that, and then we'll have a break and then we'll have a final session on responding to Orientalism. So without further ado, that's all luck. All right. um, thank you so much. What I would like to do uh, this afternoon is offer some commentary in the way of clarifying what I have tried to do in restating Orientalism. In that book, I tried to accomplish a few goals, all at once and in the span of some 350 pages. In an ideal world, again, as I did with, with, uh, with the possible state, but in or restating Orientalism, the situation is milder. Almost every chapter in that book uh, could, could have been a monograph, uh, independent monograph. As an introductory point, I want to underscore the fact that Said's take on Orientalism was purely political and representational. The latter, meaning representation, was being the, the literary critical approach that Said knew best. Mine was an epistemological approach that asked how we know and understand phenomena. And more importantly, why do we understand them in a particular way? This difference in approach, in outlook at things in the world, has profound effects on how to diagnose problems, how to critique them, and what substitutes might be introduced as a remedy. Concerning the latter, the substitutes, I also want to say that that, that here lies yet another difference. Said did not make any attempt at preferring a solution or a suggested solution, which is fine if all things are equal. Every, not everyone who critiques is required to offer solutions. 
But in the case of Saeed, or should I say, in the way he approached the entire issue of Orientalism, solutions are impossible to give. Because the problems for him were universal and trans-historical, all at once. For him, there is a diff no difference between modern colonialism and pre-modern ones. For all empires do effectively the same thing and behave in the same manner, whether it is the an ancient Greek, Roman, Islamic, or British, or American. This confusion, like a few related others, is intimately connected with the fact that Said possessed a particularly poor concept of history and historiography. And this historical myopia resulted in a serious flaw in terms of the important questions of what is impact, what is colonialism. As I will discuss later, the very question of qualitatively distinguishing between modern and non-modern empire is crucial for any critique of the study of the other whether it is through Orientalism, anthropology, ethnology, or for that matter, the study of any aspect of nature, geography, astrophysics, engineering, agriculture, and whatnot. It was not a mere coincidence that the modern state arose concurrently with an unprecedented forms of colonialism. It was not a mere coincidence that colonialism arose concurrently, concurrently with a new conception of economics, labor, and capitalism. It was not a coincidence that capitalism arose in tandem with the militarized and bureaucratic state. And it certainly was in no way a coincidence that underneath it all, a classical liberal conception of the world arose from an interplay between an expanding bourgeois interest and the philosophical justification of the political imprint of economics, a massive discursive justification that we we, 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 come, we came to call enlightenment. Said, like the vast majority of enlightened, enlightenment philosophers, and like the greatest bulk of post-colonial uh, scholars, could not see a systemic collusion between liberal reason, that is, liberal forms of rationality, and empire, and much less between these and enlightenment's genocidal and destructive tendencies. Against, I must say, the natural world and the human order, which are, of course, integral to each other. He recognized that Orientalism is anti-human. That's his word. But he could not see that liberalism and its enlightenment were no less so. Let me now take a step back while trying to expand on themes, on these unrelated themes. I would like to make a few points, the first of which is one that my critics severely misunderstood. The less careful reader of Restating Orientalism did not understand correctly my relationship to Said's work, having taken my partially favorable attitude to it as a blanket approval under whose umbrella I modify some of Said's conclusions. The misunderstanding went as far as to inflate uh, the, the conflate the coverage of Said's critique almost in fictional dimensions or inflate his work too, because there is, there is lots of attribution to, to his work that really doesn't exist in his work. It's like a back projection of what we are doing now. I suspect some of the commentators did not even read Said's book, or even my own, at least not carefully enough. At the time it was published, his work was timely, which is to say, precisely, that it perhaps suited the circumstances of the time, the late 70s and 1980s, although one could easily charge that Said's Orientalism lagged way behind even the early critique of the Frankfurt School, which was something like 30, 40 years before it. Nonetheless, the new impulse that his work created became quickly stunted because the critique itself, being essentially political and stylistic, rather than substantive and epistemological, could not catch up with the crisis of late modernity and the meaning of the destructive trends towards ecology, environment, humanity itself, etc., which is to say toward nature and the natural world as a meaning. Therefore, I could not have been any less interested in Said's work except for the fact that it has become canonical, which is to say that it was made to continue to speak for the so-called post-colonial contingency in modern academia. 
I want to make it clear yet again that restating Orientalism is not so much about Saeed's work, but about the impasse in post-colonial studies, and specifically about the reasons for this impasse, that is, the poverty of our existing epistemology and its relation to ethics. The second idea in this critical project was the fact that Saeed's work has not changed a thing in Western study of Asia and Africa, especially Islam. If a change is to be detected, it is that the discipline of Oriental study, the study of Islam, Islamic studies, the Middle East, of, or MENA, whatever you want to call it, has become somewhat more sophisticated, but none the more constructive. If Orientalism was, as Saeed once described, anti-human, I maintain and continue to do so with conviction that it remains anti-human by dint of the phenomenon that our system of knowledge and the fundamental substrate that envelops and underlines it are likewise anti-human. This is in fact the first lesson one can learn from such an intellectual exercise, that anthropocentrism turned against itself by privileging the human over everything else by assigning sovereignty onto the uh, human as the center of the world, an epistemological return to pre-Copernican conception of the world, the new man, or rather the new man-god, has trampled humanity under his own feet. This anti-humanism, which Saeed thought was a prerogative of Orientalism, was and remains the most quintessential attribute of the modern and late modern project. One could say that the discourse of fraternité, égalité, and liberté as well as the entire discourse of human rights and democracy and freedom, all of it functions to mask a regime of truth that is anything but a genuine implementation of these concepts. So to put it in another way, all that Saeed's work has accomplished was to inoculate Orientalism against structural revisions, against the intrusions of a genuine post-colonial discourse. Genuine post-colonial discourse. Saeed's Orientalism is anything but, um, but, but post-colonial. There is absolutely nothing in our established present structures of knowledge that has escaped the colonial, imperial, anti-human, and destructive impulse. And it's all, by the way, in the name of the revisions that Saeed made. Not, not, not only that, given some exceptions, which by definition exclude the rule, and which also by definition it could not open, it could not up append, our so-called post-colonial work and all the ink that has been spilled in the name of this approach has not affected in the least our systems of knowledge as I have just described. The effect of the Saidian contribution was not a qualitative revision in Oriental studies or the creation of a genuine post-colonial field, but rather a robust discourse of political correctness. Very few post-colonial thinkers are willing to go as far as to question the fundamentals of the system they themselves so severely criticize. It is undeniable that there remains conceptual sacred cows that have not been subjected to genuine scrutiny, either out of fear to offend secularized theological presuppositions or out of sheer inability to see the, correct, the, the connectedness of various parts of the structured reality we call modernity. I want to be specific here, and I want to register the point that I now regret not de de delving further, that is, in restating Orientalism, into the problematics of post-colonial studies as they have issued from the Saidian court. In that book, I repeatedly comment on one of Said's major impediments that stood between him and the genuine critique of Orientalism, and in fact, academia in its enti in entirety, namely, that he could not free himself from deeply ingrained, commit, ingrained commitments to liberal principles, whether they are of, 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 of discourse or of action. On balance, I think the field of post-colonial studies continues to do the same, either glossing over liberalism as if it is irrelevant to the crisis of modernity, or when it is criticized, to critique the surface of it mostly in terms of its economic and political practices, which have clearly been entwined with empire colonialism, depredation, and destruction. But the post-colonial field has failed to go deeper, to question the association of uh, and codependency of the political and economic dimensions 
with the conceptual sacred cows of freedom and rational autonomy. And that is where the, the real stuff lies. The Kantian trio of freedom, rationality, and the will have yet to be subjected to a new critique, one without whom post-colonial studies cannot be considered to have achieved anything. In order to, to in, in, in other words, for post-colonial studies to take off as a genuinely new field, as a field of critique that is more than just a band-aid solution, it must seriously, thoroughly, and deeply engage with these, concept, uh, with these concepts as um, integral to empire and destruction of both the physical habitat and the structures of human communal existence. So I speak, I, so I repeat, restating Orientalism wanted to address this problem from its roots, so as to say that the entire conception that Saeed came up with was inadequate from its source. And more importantly, that the past 40 years of post-colonial work remains sorely stunted. To critique Orientalism and the entirety of our systems of knowledge, it is not enough to question empire colonialism and their ugly practices. We need to engage with the ontological and epistemological basic blocks that made up the world that permitted such phenomena to arise in the first place. The third point I want to make also runs against universalizing and generalizing about empire, and specifically about the connections or complicity between knowledge and power. For it is not automatic that any and all forms of political power do or could develop such a relation with knowledge, because not all knowledge is usable for power. And some, such as ethical knowledge, is utterly useless for that purpose. For knowledge to be usable for power, it must meet at least two necessary conditions, which together make for a sufficient condition of causality. First, to acknowledge, uh, to, to, for knowledge to, to, to serve power in any meaning or way we speak of in Foucauldian terms today, it must be, that is, knowledge must be capable of being influenced or made by or through political agency whether directly or indirectly. The Foucauldian narrative is apt because Europe never knew any form of legislation or law that is not made by a coercive sovereign, including the modern state, which everybody agrees on. I repeat, the Foucauldian narrative is apt because Europe never knew any form of legislation or law that is not made by a coercive sovereign. For knowledge to collude with power, it must be thus capable of political manipulation to a degree that makes it vulnerable to the penetration of political might. And when I say knowledge, I want to insert a large dose of secular or secularized scientific knowledge and this paradigmatic scientific habitus as integral to both knowledge systems and biopolitics, as I spoke of a little earlier. Second, the law itself must potentially be at least capable of accommodating the desiderata of power. In other words, it must not have sufficiently strong principles of autonomy that could successfully re resist state power, even curb it. Here one may ask, why was Islamic knowledge not amenable to political manipulation in the way European knowledge of the 18th and 19th century was? And I just spoke about, for example, the, one of the most important things in our lives, the whole system of education. It was never, could never be appropriated by political power. And even if we just go by that alone, it is already something to contend with. Here we have to reckon with the solid fact that political power had very little to do with the initial formation of Islamic rule, which is to say that law was not only autonomous, but was also fashioned in ways that do not allow for political manipulation. What made for this resilience was the profound interconnection and interdependence between the Sharia and the vast array of other sciences. Typically, the Muslim scholar was more, than, more, more often than not productive in a wide variety of different fields, all of which retained, retained the law through a structure of uh, thought that was heavily geared toward ethical principles. It was usual to find individual writers producing long and short works in as different fields as Quranic studies, history, poetry, and other. 
law, logic, disputation, theory, theology, even philosophy, and especially mysticism, in one variety or another. The close proximity between and among these fields is not a formal matter. The cultivation of knowledge, however professionalized it, it became after the 11th century, remained anchored in a tendency that eventually connected abstract thought to modes of ethical conduct. The central domain of the Sharia, in its theoretical underpinning, theology in all its forms, and many philosophical strands, and the entire range of Sufism, all were geared toward articulating the theoretical and discursive methods that aided in the pursuit of ethical or spiritual life. These being connected at various junctures, but often differing in their approach to achieving their goals. Most commonly, the Sharia ah and its various approaches to the technologies of the self and the production of the moral subject, while Sufism, a highly individualized philosophical spirituality, navigated at a higher level of pious formation and mostly argued for the indispensability of the Sharia ah to the true Sufi. <coughs> However different the approach and even the subject matter, the desideratum constituted a common denominator, namely the cultivation of the moral subject. The educational and intellectual disciplines were textually oriented, which is to say that the genealogies of their bodies of, uh, of, of knowledge were governed by the practice of commentary and study of text, but all within a discursive tradition in the best anthropological sense. The founding text was, of course, the Quran. But within one or two generations after the text acquired the Vulgate, individual scholars began to elaborate the significance of the Quranic language in a variety of ways, resulting in the numerous fields of study I have just mentioned. In one important way, one can say, and I'm saying this not, I didn't say this, after 10 or 20 years of being an academic, I say it now after 40 years, 40 some years of studying, and I, I, I see almost every, all these disciplines I've named as, as annotations of the Quran. This, this, is a, this, is, this seems to me like the entire scholarly tradition, discursive tradition, both in Islam, it comes like a, 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 a pyramid, where the Quran is, is from the Quran, you, you have the entirety of. Of, of discursive and textual practices that run the entire field. Education and scholarship were not only driven by an ethical trust, but they were highly individualized phenomena at, at, all at once. This is also to say that the education and all intellectual activities surrounding, surrounding it was neither the province nor the jurisdiction of any political power, as I argued before. Although rulers did engage heavily in endowing waqfs, charitable trust, trust for the benefit, benefit of education, which involved the alienation of the property endowed and thus rendering it largely autonomous. Of course, by establishing these charitable educational foundations, some rulers aimed to garner support and acquisition of legitimacy which depended on the cooperation of the scholars and their willingness to mediate between these rulers and the civic population. Again, civic population between courts. But this never under any circumstance meant that these rulers could decide or partake in the decision on what the substance of educational material could be or should be, a decision that always remained in the hands of the private scholars which means that raising the new generation was in their hands, not in the hands of any political entity. This fact is of monumental importance for us, as we will see a bit later. But I must make sense of these generalizations in specific ways. And here the theory of, the, of paradigms becomes relevant and helpful. The subjects and, and, and fields of Islamic learning in their divisions and subdivisions were countless and nearly inexhaustible. Yet, they stood in a particular relationship to each other, one that could be said to have had a cohesive structure in which cross-fertilization was routine. Leading components in this structure were the Sharia and Sufis, two discursive traditions and paradigmatic domains that permeated the educational, legal, social, and spiritual practices of Islam. 
and influence much, much in the economic and mercantile sphere. In point of fact, the Sharia governed urban, mercantile, and countryside agricultural economy, and in maritime law regulated commerce in the Indian Ocean, the South China Seas, much of the Eastern Mediterranean and elsewhere. That's something not many people know. And so it was generally followed by even non-Muslims navigating these high seas. Furthermore, because for purposes of training, for trading, but, but not, they didn't adopt it personally, but it was a mode of transaction. Uh, sh furthermore, Sharia law was the dominant form of practice in city markets, and the Sufi guilds and orders were no less active as specifically Sufi entities in the mercantile life of these cities. But Sufism infused society in nearly comprehensive ways, having created countless orders around which much of social life revolved, even, and quite interestingly, giving rise to dynastic empires grounded in these very orders. Notice, and this is very significant, notice that this is quite different from saying that a dynasty, as dynasty, created the Sufi order, which, to my knowledge, never happened. If anybody can inform me on this one, I'd be very grateful. It, that Sufi or like the Safavids were created, were created the Safavid Empire. It was originally a Sufi order. But it, the other way around, it never happened. So all this made for a truly civil society, where the ruler could collected taxes and audited practices, but could never decide on the origins, form, shape, or very structure of these associations. However much he attempted to regulate them for purposes of taxation and administrative management. Nearly every scholar of the law was a Sufi of some sort, and so were non-scholars and quasi-scholars, such as merchants, princes, princesses, emirs, and, 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 and who often dabbled in one form of learning and another. All you have to do is read the, the tarikh works of, of Islam. You will see this plenty. It could, could be said that while the Sharia was performative in regulating society, somewhat in the way modern law uh, does, Sufism constituted a performative field that functioned in regulating and organizing the spiritual and often material life of society. But what distinguishes both from any modern discursive tradition, and this is extremely important for my argument, is that is their extraordinary emphasis on the production of moral technologies of the self a private, psychological, and introspective technology that no state could regulate or impose. The Sharia represented and was constituted by a moral law. Its paradigmatic status lied in the very fact of its being a moral system in which law, in the modern sense, was a tool and technique, as I said before, that was subordinated to, the in, to and enmeshed in the overarching uh, moral apparatus. But it was not an end in itself. In the Sharia, the law was the instrument of the moral, not the other way around. This is a foundational truth of monumental importance. As a central domain, the Sharia was the measure against which the subsidiary domains were judged, and its, resolution, its solutions largely determined the solution of those domains. In the pedagogical sphere, or, or all with the pedagogical spheres for that matter, the structure of Muslim education was determined by priorities laid down in the Sharia and was run entirely by private specialists, such, 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 such fields as language, linguistics, hermeneutics, rhetoric, dialectic, and logic were created, developed, and refined within the purview of the Sharia domain. Even mathematics and astronomy, which became the foundations of early modern science in Europe, evolved to impressive degrees as, res as, as responses to Sharia stimuli, stimuli. In whatever field a scholar or an intellectual ultimately specialized, his or her basic undergraduate training, quote unquote, was nearly always Sharia, as were the fields which were preparatory for the study of Sharia. Those fields that prepared the student for the study of the Sharia uh, subfields preferred other students for nearly every other field, be it uh, theology, adab, astronomy, optics, or mathematics. If you look at the, the, the physicians and the opticians, all of them know the Sharia. Uh, 
philosophers, the philosophers, all of them knew at least some, some basics of the Sharia, including Farabi and uh, the peripheral domains, on the other hand, catered to the demands and priorities of the Sharia and were often designed and organized to serve its needs. One might even say that the Sharia stood as paradigmatic as science stands for us today. Yet, one should not draw from this picture the conclusion that subsidiary and peripheral domains stood apart from the Sharia and its intellectual and educational interests. As, for example, poetry stands apart from engineering in the modern academy. They have nothing to do with, the, with, with each other. For as we have seen, individual scholars engage over the range of their career several disciplines at once, navigating between and among fields that we nowadays consider wholly unrelated. In the practical sphere, economic life, however messy, was regulated not only by technical Sharia rules, but also by a per pervasive Sharia ethic. Violations and occasional evasions of the system no doubt existed, but these never amounted to any regularity that could install them as norms. This is, this, the, the, the is here could never become the sole standard of the ought. The practices of the is, in other words, could never constitute even a peripheral domain. This is why the Sharia court decisions cannot be precedent in Islam. But the fatwa is. It, the, this distinction is really related to is and the ought and the, the way Muslims indirectly accepted or rejected one version of them or another. The economic domain was Sharia minded because society, the subject, object, and predicate of the Sharia, was Sharia. And political governance, while being less organic to the social domain than it was connected to the economic realm, was constrained by a culture and society that by and large knew and accepted the Sharia and its paradigmatic ethical st stature. This is, of course, not to suggest that the paradigmatic status of the Sharia ensured an ideal life. I want to be very clear about this. Any such understanding is utterly misguided, as many of the critics of, of especially impossible states said. As we have emphasized earlier, paradigms or central domains are not only supported by subsidiary domains. Together with the latter domains, they embody exceptions, irregularities, and violations, all of which amount to subversive discourses, often contingent and ephemeral, but at times not. The Sharia was no exception in that it had to live in, in a society that was, like any other, messy and in constant need of certain forms of order and organization. That society, no, that society no doubt, witnessed the overtaxed peasant, the criminal, the insolvent uh, debtor, and the abused wife, not to mention the loud, if not influential, poet advocating unconventional uh, uh, sexual mores nor were all segments of the population inclined to the Sharia norms. The Bedouins, for example, in part, had, had their own customs, often conflicting with these norms. All we have to do is read the, the Fatawa collections, the big ones, like uh, Burzuli and uh, Wan Sharisi, and you will see what I mean. And of course, we know of such manipulative techniques as the Hiya, which were nothing less than elaborations by the Jews themselves. Likewise, like any social grouping, Muslim societies from North Africa and Muslim Spain to Java and Samarkand had its share of misery. It obviously had its own invaders and conquerors, it, its rebels, <coughs> larcenists, petty thieves, highway robbers, and even the occasional corrupt judge. Nonetheless, and it is an emphatic nonetheless, the Sharia was the normative system and the law of the land. Its paradigmatic discourses and practices persisting in the continual recreation of a particular order and, more importantly, a particular subject. With their military might and often unmatched power sultans in Islam, the heads of the executive came and went, one after the other, without as little as a murmur about an ambition to challenge the Sharia as the domain of legal production. This was the unchallenged law and every sultan accepted it as de facto and as, as well as the jury. Both Sharia and Sufism 
being constituted by an ethical and moral subject matter down from their epistemological foundations and up to their social dispensations when they were applied strove toward the realization of moral ends, being central paradigms and performative discourses, they may be characterized by what I call a persistent moral benchmark. Benchmarks do not always, I want to emphasize this, benchmarks do not always fully succeed in implementing their desiderata in the real world, but rather stand as reminders and standards against which reality is not only measured, but also pressured. This is precisely what made the Sharia an asymptotic system of law. A persistent benchmark is one whose pressure is greater than those possessed by other benchmarks, especially if its matrix and source of authority stem from a central domain. Take, for example, dualistic personality. In its long life, just to illustrate the issue of the benchmark, in its long life about, of about 12 centuries, the Sharia encountered numerous issues that required it to treat certain concepts and institutions in terms more abstract than the concept of private legal person. Perhaps the most notorious and important context in which a type of juristic personality came to be recognized existed within the juristic elaboration of charitable trusts, the otherwise known as waqf or habus. As a legal institution and instrument, the waqf acquired an abstract juristic personality, acting as such in juridical claims and litigation. Thus, a waqf, qua waqf, may sue for damages or recovery of rent of its own property, which was often the income that sustained the operation and maintenance of the waqf itself. My point is that the legal instruments to construct an abstract legal entity had existed and these were sophisticated by any standard. Yet, when economic developments imposed requirements on the legal system, the Sharia, even though it succeeded in developing complex forms of trade, investment, and commercial partnerships, the Sharia refused to grant commercial and financial enterprises the same concepts of juristic personality, stopping as it did at the limits of individual responsibility and personal liability. In other words, despite the complexity of legal instruments it had developed, the Sharia stopped short of developing any concept of limited liability. And it is easy to see why it did so. One of the central benchmarks of the Sharia is the notion of Shari subject. One who is constituted by moral technologies of the self technologies in which ethical and moral liability of the individual believer, the subject, stand supreme. This benchmark was not only operative, but performative, which is to say that it was not only applied without reticence, but in the process of its operation, it produced subjects. The premium value in this configuration was moral accountability. And this is where it, below, it, it, it ties with the corporation. Moral, individual moral accountability, not profit. Money and wealth were of such secondary status, despite the great importance Islam and its Sharia placed on business, profit, and material wealth, they were of such secondary status that they could hardly compete with the fundamental, if not constitutive, concept of ethical duty and individual moral responsibility, which is to say the general accountability of the private person. There was no financial or material consideration in the world, however tempting and important, that could alter or mitigate the benchmark of individual and personal accountability, responsibility and liability. This type of accountability and responsibility was irreducible and constituted the most stubborn feature of the entire culture. Now compare all this with the rise of the corporation in the 17th century West, a corporation that created both the state and its colonizing corporation, the East India Company, the East India types we know so well, both from the British and the Dutch side. There is, there is much more to say as to why Islamic knowledge in general and the Sharia in particular 
did not supply enough potential or material for opening up the necessary space for collusion with power, as did, for example, money and the, and, and, and the corporation in, in the case of Europe. Yeah. The state and the corporation were essential in the whole business of colonization, as well as the law. Everything worked together in Europe to colonize. So I wonder how, with a system like the Sharia I have been describing, why Islam first didn't develop the corporation? And that's a question that has nothing to do with colonialism. Without anything, why didn't Islam develop the corporation? And second, that why it could not use all of this knowledge for, uh, for political purposes? That's it. Thank you very much. Oh, right. sorry to take so long. Uh, uh, it was so much, uh, it, it's such a rich presentation that um, I want to give the floor to, uh, to all of you asking questions. So I'm going to make a few very brief points under two main headings. First, where I agree, and second, where I disagree. Uh, where I agree, first of all, I think that restating Orientalism was a long, long, long overdue um, critique of Edward Said. Edward Said had been critiqued within, by, first of all, the Orientalists themselves, and uh, by Islamic studies scholars who often, in fact, set him aside because he wasn't very useful, as, as Professor Halak correctly notes. But he still stood to the people outside the field, which is majority of the world, as the voice of progressive Islam, as the voice of progressive academia, as the voice of how to deal with Orientalism. And as somebody who, who encounters Said as an undergraduate and then graduate, I found exactly the problems that Professor Halak describes, which in a word, Islam disappears from Said's analysis. Said's Solution to the problem of Orientalist bias is to say Islam really doesn't exist as a system that anybody should study. The minute you talk about Islam, you are engaging in some kind of stereotype. You're, you're, you're saying something essentialist. You shouldn't do that. We are really no different from you. And that effectively is what Saeed was saying, which is very much a liberal humanist message, and many people found it empowering. But when it came to studying Islam, whether Muslim societies or Islamic doctrine, it really meant stop doing it. There is no need. He didn't do it, and he didn't want you to do it. And I think that Professor Halak's book eloquently and forcefully uh, brings that out. Um, the second part, uh, I guess I should also say that um, I'm also in enthusiastic agreement with aspects of uh, uh, Professor Halak's critique of corporation, the, uh, the, you know, the impossibility of getting over limited liability, or getting over liability and responsibility and moral responsibility in the Sharia, and things such as inheritance laws and prohibition of usury and so on and so forth, uh, that could not, uh, despite having free market and private property, which is respected in Islam, and in a sense you could say all of the basic principles of capitalism really emerge in Islam, um, with the exception of the most predatory uh, and destructive parts, which are usury and, uh, and limited liability corporation, um, and the accumulation of wealth you know, through inheritance, uh, often it was averted and, and so on. There are other elements as such as sultanistic absolutism and whether that <coughs> led to uh, the decline of trade and, uh, or not, that's something I'm going to set aside. That's a scholarly debate, although I tend to agree with uh, Professor Halak's uh, account. Now, the second comment I want to make is um, I will label that as truth and method. Whether the truth that we discover is dependent on our method being right. And whether a critique of method means that the truth that has been discovered should be discarded or is, uh, is therefore worthless. Um, and 
that's of course, uh, for those of you familiar with this literature, that would uh, remind you of Gadamer's uh, uh, work, but I will make it very concrete and simple. Um, so I want to look at aspects of Islamic history, and then I will talk a little bit about why I'm doing that, why I'm challenging some of the presentation of Professor Halak, without disagreeing with his overall thrust. Um, first of all, we may ask, of course, why did Sharia fail if it was so good? Was it really too good to survive? Was it really that colonialism produced such power that uh, the Sharia that was satisfying people left and right uh, was unable to provide uh, a, a counter? Is it simply be simply a power, is it simply a calculus of violence? Or was there something else going on? And if that's the question, what is the mode, register, in which we can ask that question? Um, and so my, also my concern is that a, 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 an extreme hygienic presentation of Islamic history disempowers us in a way from asking that kind of question and fails to let us learn from it, because if it's something that has been happening, we can recover from it. But if modernity is such an exceptional condition that it has never happened before, then there is no example in our tradition uh, to learn from it and recover. And so it is only in that spirit that I look at Islamic history uh, critically, uh, which is not to say that I don't have the same sense of love and respect and awe uh, for our tradition and uh, the ulama and, uh, 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 and, and the masters of the tradition uh, that, that Dr. Professor Halak does. Um, to give you a few quick examples, falsafa, for instance, far from being a footnote to the Qur'an, was in fact fairly clear in reducing the Qur'an to myth and poetry. And the Qur'an was treated as a mine, uh, as a mine of quotable quotes, doesn't mean that structurally it and it had any. And this was, there were perhaps exceptions to it, but it's very difficult to accept that somebody like Ibn Sina, or uh, even Al Farabi is too far, or, uh, or Razi, Abu Bakr Al Razi, has just rejected it downright. But somebody like even Ibn Rushd. Uh, did not take the Qur'an as sort of the real structure of truth, but more like a useful uh, for the masses. So I don't, I, so I think that that, and that was a fairly widespread discourse in the post-Mongol period in the uh, Persianate world in, in Persia and, and uh, Mughal India, for example. Um, Uh, similarly, uh, the question of Hayyal and Ottoman interest, for example, uh, or Ottoman engagement in, in usury uh, based on double sale Hila, in fact, became such a practice that in the Ottoman realm, your, your rate of interest was 12%, while in Europe, it's 4%. So you, in fact, have far worse situation in Muslim lands where Sharia is applied than uh, it is in Europe. Similarly, Muslim physics and astronomy, for instance, uh, and, and sciences largely remain confined to the received Ptolemaic system, for example, in astronomy, despite important advances. But today, we cannot imagine going back to Aristotelian assumptions of physics, for, for instance. And there, the question comes up, you know, whatever whether it was capitalism or state that led to our, uh, a modern understanding of first Newtonian, uh, Copernican, Newtonian, or Einstein's uh, relativity, and so on. This is the discourse that we have, and regardless of, the, if you will, the method that led us to it, I think that um, we need to have our own critical relationship to that history, but nevertheless, we are not going back to thinking um, 
what Aristotle thought about gravity, for example, or where life comes from, and so on. Um, I guess one, one example I want to give of, uh, for example, the relationship between to what extent uh, Muslim dynasts could depart from the model of, say, the Rashidun Khal Khulafa and, and what we consider to be a proper Islamic uh, ruler. This example that I just came across recently, um, Safawi Tariqa was a Sufi, Sunni Sufi Tariqa, in fact, which, um, which then became part of this uh, militant radical movement, and most of the followers, Izzelbash or Redheads, uh, had extreme Qurrami, uh, extreme uh, Wulat beliefs. And if you look at some of the uh, practices in the early Safavid court, for instance, we have a fairly well-documented instance uh, seen both, recorded both within in the indigenous sources as well as by a European ambassador, for instance, that the Safavi Shah would command to show his arbitrary power, command his courtiers to kill and eat one of the courtiers, and they would do that. Cannibalism, to show absolute power. This is happening because he is God. His poetry says so, he claims so. This is happening in a major Muslim empire. And my point is to say, well, these are horrible, horrible things. Most Muslims would, 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 are, would be horrified by this. But this is part of our history. Is this an exception? And if this is an exception, it's a whole, there's a whole lot of it that we need to wrestle with. Um, I guess one also, one thing that, uh, it's sort of a, a bit of a theoretical uh, critique, which is that I, you know, in the presentation of the model that Professor Halak has of, uh, of Islamic societies, the ideal almost is in the middle of Saljuk and Mamluk societies, between the empires. So you take out the Umayyad and the Abbasid period and take out the Ottoman period, it's the middle that uh, seems to be the ideal period. But it seems to me that both the Ottoman periods in some ways, and the early period, especially the Sirah of the Prophet ﷺ and the Rashidun period, uh, and the Umayyad period, and, and the early Abbasid period, are extremely crucial in that they are formative. And, you know, you could count in terms of secular time and say, well, these were only a couple centuries as opposed to the rest of the centuries, but in terms of normative time, those centuries are, in a sense, for Muslims thinking normatively timeless. Um, and this is not to say that we, we should ignore the rest of the history, but simply that I think that in Muslim imagination you cannot uh, marginalize that early normative period from thinking about uh, whether it's politics or formation of law or uh, jihad and conquest and so on and so forth. So that remains, I think, um, as we're thinking of post fourth uh, or 10th century uh, Islam, we also need to account for the changes that are taking place, and especially uh, the normative period. So uh, these are, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much. Very good uh, questions and responses. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot of questions myself, but I'm gonna hand it over to the floor. Um, so. Without further ado, Bismillah. So I want to go back to uh, the impossible state. So my, my very oversimplistic understanding of your thesis is that you are critiquing the nation state, secularism, and modernity using an Islamic, uh, alternate Islamic framework, Islamic paradigm, Islamic system, okay? So here's my question. Do you think the predicament that modernity is in is just a byproduct of the most recent iteration of like thesis, antithesis, synthesis, mm -hmm. and it only requires another antithesis and another synthesis in order to fix it? Or 
modernity has hit a brick wall and we have to throw it into the trash and to start from the drawing boards. And if we're gonna do that, here's the second question. And, and we're gonna use the Islamic system as a reference. Do you use it only at the level of or you are going to have a toolbox from which you are going to borrow some of the systems and institutions and instruments that you have referred to in the Islamic system. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Can I? Uh, yeah, you can respond to that. Yeah. I've got too much. It's, it's, a very, it's an excellent. It's an excellent question. Uh, I, I would say that it is mostly a combination of, of both, but mostly it is as a tool system. When, when I invoke the, the Islamic tradition, I've studied it for all of my life. And, and uh, uh, of course, there is something in it that will be useful for Muslims themselves, to, uh, su such as the impossible state. It was intended for world audience, in a sense. But, um, but it happened to find an echo uh, in, in the Muslim world, and the Arab world, more than other places. And so that's wonderful because it proved to be at least helpful in the sense that it creates debate. Mm -hmm. It makes people think about what they are doing. And that's what, what the function of scholars is. Uh, but, but, but also at the same time, this is why I say it's both. Uh, but at the same time, it is, it, is, it is also a toolbox where I use this history. Alistair McIntyre used uh, first Aristotle and later uh, Thomas Aquinas as his kind of paradigm for creating a, a, an ethical narrative as a critique of modernity. But these people are just philosophers who are important, wonderful, and I'm impressed by them too. I like to read them both. There's no problem with, with, with his choice, except that they, these are just individuals who happen to be philosophers, who happen to articulate wonderful ideas, whether you would disagree with them or not. I'm talking about an, an actual Islamic uh, uh, history, which even if you would disagree with part of it, still the general understanding is there and many, 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 many people, especially if you, if you ask the generation before the present one, people who lived before the 60s and 70s, they will actually be agreeing with me more. Suddenly now, I told you before, uh, that, 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 that there is there's change of heart about Islamic history. And actually the comment about the self of it uh, is, is an exact illustration of what I'm talking about. Uh, and I will come to this for a second because it, I find it quite uh, pungent. Um, but, but, but it is, a, a, I use Islamic history as a, therefore as a heuristic, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a system of, of instruction, so to speak, to teach us about what is possible and where we can, for example, I deal with the corporation I just talked about, mm -hmm. is that we need to understand that, that, that the British, even the British Parliament itself, allowed, uh, created the concept of limited liability, and once it saw, and within three years, it saw the uh, effects of what happened. Widows and people, and many households went bankrupt and suffered because of this limited liability, because the, the, this is the, the, the embryo of the corporation, right? Mm. Um, it uh, outlawed it. Within three years, this is, this is actually this is, this is an immoral entity. They described it in ethical moral terms. That's the British Parliament. The rest is history. You know that it came back from the uh, came back from the back door, went to the Delaware, where of course anything can happen. The state of Delaware. That's why most co big corporations in the world are registered in Delaware because right. they can do anything. Right. Delaware will give them anything. It's a matter of making money, really. Right. right. Because all the litigation happens there. It's like instead of having tourist destination, you have a litigation destination. Right. That's what. And so, so, so you get the corporation. Out of it is ruling our life. It is actually beginning to dominate the state, right? right? And so, when you have when you have a heuristic, a real society that lived with all the money and the legal tools to create the corporation, and yet did not, on on principle that we did not want to go there, they did not. There is a moment always, and when you do something abhorrent, there is always a moment where you can say yes or no. You can always stop somebody. Because you say, well, yet you have to make the first committed step towards something, say, okay, I can't go there. I have to retreat. Even if you are tempted to do it. Why did the Muslims do it and, and averted the rise of the corporation, but, the, but the, the modern Western Europe in particular couldn't? It first resisted and then it succumbed. As for this uh, 
a gruesome episode. It's, it's again, it is, it is, it is, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, uh, of Amir. This is, this is replicating the sensationalism of the Western conception of violence in Islam. First, I don't know who reported it. I'm not saying that it didn't happen. Probably it happened, and I'm going to grant you that it happened. <laughs> but, but, but is this a proof that this constitutional structures mm -hmm. and the, the way Islam operated politically over 1,200 years of its history until, until the 19th century, that's a proof that, that, that there were barbarians or that they were, they, 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 they ruled it, and there were rulers who, uh, their rulers, some of whom were uh, barbarians? Well, remember, that's not my, that well, wasn't my point to begin with. And I think, I hope nobody understood the point to be that. Yeah. The point precisely was agency comes precisely from recognizing the terrible things that happened in the past. And, and we have recovered. We have, we have been able to maintain the norm against these, now, the Safavids, early Safavids were maybe not all cannibals, but they were, <laughs> they were a lot of this stuff. You look at their poetry, you look at their, they're very proud of this absolute power. So it's not that one incident. My point is, this, stuff like this, or, or for example, the Ottoman elite and pederasty and drinking and all that stuff, which was seen as you know something you couldn't stop, it was so widespread. Mm. That also happened, usury and so on. Once we learn that, look, this stuff happened, and, and yet we could recover. So it's not like what we are facing is an exception, such an exceptional situation. Yes, it is not. So, so that's all. And that <laughs> but what does it tell us if it's not an exceptional situation? If, if, if I could tell you about just the, the electric chair in, 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 in so many many American states. We can, we can also describe it in secessionalist terms. And we say this is actually a barbarian, or we do, we say it's a barbarian practice. Does it, does it really undermine the fundamental principles of American democracy as we understand them today? Well, some people say it does, but my point is not, my point is that it doesn't. It, it, in my examples don't do that. My examples are added on to strengthen the narrative that you have, not to weaken it. Because I think... Okay, then I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 uh, back to the first question, Dr. Allah. Is, is uh, modernity utterly failed? Or it just, if we can think of... Ah, this, uh, is, this is a good question, too. It's an excellent question. You know what Habermas said? That post-modernity is the continuation of the... Because the, the continuation of the project of modernity, because the project of modernity is not complete. Right. And so as if, you know, and this is, I think, a desp desperate attempt on the part of Hab Habermas and others to say basically that we can, we can, maybe there is still some hope. Mm. The fact of the matter, I think that mo modernity will never, cannot have a future if it persists in its central paradigms the, the way it is. In other words, if it continues to practice the same mentality and in in institutional practices as we know through, for example, a, a particular kind of government and capitalism, mm and industrialism, which is controlled by the, the former two, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is doomed to not only to failure and bankruptcy, it is in a state of failure and bankruptcy. We are in a state of bankruptcy. If we were to judge modernity in legal terms, we should file bankruptcy yesterday. Mm -hmm. But maybe I am not, I'm not, I don't know. I, mean, I, I cannot imagine, I don't know how to, to conceptualize it. But maybe something will begin to, happen now where we, if we do take drastic measures, maybe that from within it, for example, we can, but then you have to overcome all the capitalist and corporate power and the state power. And I really don't know how this, this is going to happen. So as far as things are standing now, I would say yes, it has reached an end. And we need to start a new beginning somehow. We've got two questions. The question is basically, so I'd say, how far do we find a correspondence between the direction of social evolution in the direction prescribed by our particular concept of social progress. So it's a, it's a trade off between social evolution and social progress. Uh, we may properly inquire into the relation between the two. Is it possible to do so if we define social evolution in ethical? Uh, so uh, if I may comment on, if I understood the question, it has, it, it, it says effectively, is progress okay if it's ethical? And um, there are two ways of asking this question. Do human beings, have they made ethical progress? 
And an affirmative answer to that is extremely dangerous. In fact, it's one of the Achilles heels of, of modernity because what this means is that we as human beings today, if we have made definitive ethical progress, we cannot look back at the past at the ethically inferior people. Why would I look at Muhammad or Isa or Musa if I am living in a society that has as a whole, as a, as a principle of evolution, not you know as a particular society, but as humanity, I have made ethical progress. And as a atheist philosopher John Gray says, this has been one of the most destructive doctrines of, of enlightenment. Uh, it's, he's an atheist, but he says it's far more destructive than any religion has been. Because uh, to be, this, this is effectively the radical enlightenment, not, not even moderate enlightenment. This was the idea that we, we really need to throw out all past morality. And you know, this is one of those things where best intentions uh, lead to destruction. And uh, when you want to eliminate poverty, for example, by ending or, or eliminating equal, uh, freedom, um, or you want to create equality, and, and therefore you, you, know, you create a utopia. Uh, whether it's Marxist forms of this idea or, or other uh, progressive forms. Uh, so this idea could, if understood in ontological sense, could lead to this. But if it is, uh, if the idea is, look, normatively understanding our partic particular circumstances, should we make, should we think of our progress first and foremost in ethical terms, should we become better people, knowing that لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ أَجَلْ every, Everything comes to an end, that every soul has to struggle in the same way with their moral demons. We haven't become biologically or mentally better people necessarily, but we must start and we must do something about this together. Yes, in that sense, ethical progress is good. 